Hello, everybody, and welcome to Friends of the Force, a Star Wars podcast. I'm your host, Brad. And I'm your host, Sarah. And this is Andor Candor, where we talk all things Andor on Disney+. Plus. And we are so excited to bring you this episode today because Sarah and I have had the opportunity to be a part of a roundtable interview with uh, writer Bo Willman and executive producer Sonny Wallenberg, who are some of the creatives behind Andor. My gosh, just continue to be humbled and, and grateful that we are being invited to these after we talked to Nicholas Bertel and then to do this interview with you, Sarah, has been so special because we're loving Andor. Uh, and we yes. got to see episodes <laughs> 9 and 10 before we talked to uh, the creatives. And there are some of our favorite episodes of Star Wars TV. So it was really fun to pick that apart and uh, dive into it and get inside their minds. And oh gosh, I'm having such a good time with the show. It is truly so good. And and we should say it up front here that if you have not seen episode 10 yet, we do dive into across all the outlets. We do dive into some details, some spoilers about that episode. So please do yourself the favor of going and watching that episode first. Uh, it is worth it to do that before you listen to this. Um, and, and yeah, speaking of the outlets that we had the opportunity to be on this panel with, let me introduce them to you. You probably know many of them. Uh, they are Triad of the Forest, That Gay Jedi, Tatooine Sons, Star Wars Explained, Sky Talkers, Pink Milk, Us, Blast Points, and Octo Radio. So we were so delighted to be on another excellent roundtable panel. Everybody asked great questions uh, and go give their episodes some love as well. Um, yeah, with I mean, excellent questions all the way around it was just so exciting and thrilling and, and what a privilege to hear directly from the creators um in real time so yeah we hope you enjoy this interview yeah and if you enjoy this interview and want to hear more of our thoughts on episode 10 specifically we should also have our review discussion up by this point in the day so go check that out if you haven't already but uh, in case you don't know some of their work uh bo willman he worked on House of Cards, which is a pretty acclaimed series, as well as the Ides of March and Mary Queens of Scott. Uh, and Sane Wallenberg is a producer who worked on Chernobyl, which is highly revered, as well as Black Mirror, um, another show that many people are familiar with. So they are just two crazily talented people. And the fact that they get to work on a Star War and give what they've given to us is just incredible. Mm -hmm. So the quality of the show, it really stands out because of the people behind it. And with that in mind, let's turn it over to our interview with writer Bo Willman and executive producer Sonny Wallenberg. We are done with counting shifts. There is only then and now. There is only one way out. Play it how you want. But I'm going to assume I'm already dead. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Gustavo from Trial of the Force. Very excited to talk to you guys. Uh, so my question is for both of you. Uh, Andor so far has been a very precise and deliberate show. Uh, the pacing has been very intentional until we get like these moments that just hit you like a sledgehammer. Especially episode 10, we get a line from Luthen towards the end of the episode where he says, I've made my mind a sunless place. I share my dreams with ghosts. Like moments like that just like really capture what the feeling and and theming of the episode is and the series as a whole so my question is like how do these moments come about like how do we decide what characters kind of have like these moments that just like just punch you in the face and just like make your jaw drop i know it's it's uh, it's it's like sort of like asking uh you know uh professional ice skater like you know how, how do you do how do you how do you do like a triple lutz i <laughs> a lot of practice and a lot of falling down <laughs> until you get it right <laughs> um I, I i mean first and foremost it all starts with tony gilroy uh, he walked into the writer's room with uh, about an 80 page bible a very extensive and detailed idea of what he wanted to do over the course of the season there were some big gaps along the way which he admitted that we needed to figure out and um and 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 some things that he brought in that we ultimately tossed and and came up with better i hope better ideas for uh but he started with a very clear vision and and characters like luth and rail for instance or cyril and deirdre um and and some of the others along the way uh, pretty fully formed. 
you know, and, and so Dan, what Danny and I were trying to do was uh, just help flesh that out, deepen it, ask questions, poke holes, um, see if we could replace really good ideas with even better ones. Um, you know, uh, but 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 Tony's vision and leadership really gave us a, a running start. Uh, you know, when you talk about something like Kino Roy, Roy's uh, uh, arc over the course of these three seasons, we, the the notion of a prison was a pretty vague one. We knew that, okay, here's a guy who's just done the Aldani raid. Now he's on the run. Naturally, it's most interesting if something stops him being on the run. What's the most extreme version of that being thrown into a prison? Uh, how do we do a prison that isn't like every other prison movie you've ever seen in your life? Uh, it started almost from a very rudimentary place of, where, of well, most prisons are sort of dark and damp and lots of shadows and dirty what if this one's like super bright and clean you know if most prisons have lots of guards what does a prison look like that has a very few guards how do you pull that off um maybe they're maybe it's a factory maybe they're building something who knows and 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 kino is a character that we developed in the room from scratch uh, and, and, you know, layer by layer first, it's like, well, maybe he's a foreman, maybe he buys into the system. Maybe, maybe Cassian has to convince this guy in order to have a chance of getting out. And maybe now he becomes this opportunity for a mini arc where you see how over a very short amount of time, someone can go from plugging into the system as a sort of automaton into becoming a rebel, which is part and parcel of the larger story that we're trying to tell of Cassian. And, and so you, you kind of just, almost approach in these very rudimentary, simple ways, layer up, you know, one, one, uh, you know, you're learning sort of, I don't, I don't know why I brought up ice skater analogy because I know nothing about ice skating. Um, but, but, you know, you, you got to do one yeah, twirl before you do two and then three and, and eventually you, you, you hit something and you land it and you feel like that feels right, you know? So. Um, hello. Um, I wanted to bring up something, Bo, that you mentioned at your BAFTA screenwriters lecture because I've studied and worked in theater my whole life. And in that talk, you mentioned how discoveries made in earlier episodes can have an influence and ripple effect on scripts that are still in development, much like a theatrical production process. So for either of you, have there been any standout moments like these while you while you both were working on Andor? Like any moments that you revisited or rediscovered while writing that were influenced from earlier scenes or earlier episodes that you may have worked on i think san is better for this one because she's been in the trenches with tony since before i arrived and and long after i, <laughs> I finished my last draft on the script uh so you've you've witnessed everything son I, I think you know certainly for all the you know really strong vision and kind of over you know and kind of overriding kind of story arc you know that tony brought into the room and that we that but then fleshed out with the help of his you know trusted collaborators you know um Bo and and dan you know as and then you know whatever whatever wherever we took it at the writers' room, of course, then the really hard work starts because then everybody took these episodes away and then the, you know made them into you know you know an outline and then of course right really digging deep to writing the script and I think you know things evolve and you really dig deep for you know it, the finding the broader you know of a pass is you know and getting that right is you know was kind of quite you know, dynamically and quickly achieved when you have, you know, three very strong, you know, creative, you know, people in a room, you know, that really know and trust each other. And, you know, the speed that was actually in the and the, the creative feeding of each other was kind of really fast. But then when everybody dug in deeper, of course, you come across other questions and, and new things. And they constantly feed back and forward and, and, and you know, and good ideas. Then, you know, then you feed them back, you know, backwards. And I think that is a, that evolving thing when you strive for perfection and finding a very intricate, you know, multi-layered, you know, piece with a huge, you know, with a lot of players within the way I think that is very much part of the process and and if you pay attention to that and really benefit from what you find and keep on challenging you know the own process you come you know hopefully you know you get to something very you know complex and multi-layered and rewarding at the end and I, I think I got lucky too because uh the Nate, the prison is such a big build, and Sana actually had to make that happen with Luke. Uh, that I believe the prison block was shot last, right, Sana? It was it was shot last because we were quite contained, and it seemed the right way, um, you know, to kind of finish the whole show. But it also really allowed, you know, for Bo writing when you're dealing with something, with anything that you could write, and when you dug deeper into it, and then you were left with actually having to produce the scripts, but you had to 
create and Luke was our designer and we had to, you know, if it's a constant feeding back, okay, if I get to go to that corner and how does I do this? And how would this work in the prison? And it's a constantly evolving thing and having that time for that very specific world to, to kind of evolve and, you know, to be written and for us to be then allowed to, you know, able to create it. It was a good place at the, you know, to shoot it last. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and so I, you know, I'm lucky that it benefited from, uh, this incredible cast that now had months working together, Sana and Luke and everyone else. Uh, they, you know, here, here was, I, I basically got to benefit from this is the the final push here. And in a way, I guess all of those prisoners escaping Narkina five at the end, it was also for all of you, like, we're finally wrapping production. <laughs> One way out. <laughs> <laughs> One way out. <laughs> we printed t-shirts for everybody with it on. Hi, uh, I'm Sam with Tatooine Sons. First, episode 10 uh, is an absolute masterpiece. I think we can all agree with that. Um, and Andy Serkis's performance could easily win him an Emmy, in our opinion. Um, but I've just got a quick two-part question. First, did you have Andy Serkis in mind when uh, you wrote that speech to the prisoners? And second, when he was leading them in chanting One Way Out, as y'all were just saying, um, were you already considering the harsh reality that Kino Loy can't swim and potentially doesn't make it out of the prison himself? Great questions. And uh, I dig you guys a setup there. Like you've, you've really yeah. got the lighting in. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> um, um, great questions. Uh, when we're de developing characters, especially ones that were developed in the room from scratch, the way Kino was, uh, sometimes you might bang around like, you know, what a, what is this person like who might play them? And sometimes you're talking about an actor that, you know, might be, you know, from 50 years ago or something. You're, you're trying to get a sense of a vibe. You're not necessarily trying to cast it in the room. Uh, wasn't thinking of Andy or any actor when uh, per se specifically, like we're writing this towards this actor. Um, uh, but we were definitely going for a, a particular vibe. Um, and and when uh, the, and what we did know was that we wanted to write one hell of a, a cameo arc. That this was for 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 something that a, a really great guest actor could come in and essentially kind of headline those three episodes as the face of this prison. We wanted to write a role that could attract someone amazing, and um, and so luckily for us. Uh, you know, Andy was was available and wanted to do it and felt like winning the lottery um, because we were like, if we don't get someone of, of that caliber, the, the I don't think, you know, the prison will work. You know, but also I think so, eventually, you know, when when the three scripts, you know, were kind of, you know, all there and had just, you know, evolved, it, he really became somebody that. I think we all felt, you know, really drawn to, and it kind of became a natural, you know, a natural bit of casting for us. And then, you know, we were, you know, we were lucky that, you know, he felt the same about, you know, our, you know, our show and that part and, you know, and the rest is for everybody to enjoy. In terms of the very end, I can't swim. No, I mean, these are these things where you don't start with that necessarily. Uh, first is like, okay, what's the journey this guy has? You know, he he's plugged into the system. He's, if he's not pro empire, he's kind of a shill for it, for out of pure self-interest. Um, and we, okay, we're going to have a prison break at the end and he's going to be leading the way. That's quite an arc over the course of three episodes. Mm -hmm. But you're always looking, how do you subvert expectations? How Or how do you, uh, in a good way, and replace right. them with something better? How do you have the most emotional impact? If there's a triumph for this guy, you know, is there also a tragedy? Uh, and I forget whether we were talking about Luthen's speech uh, first with Young or or the ending for Kino, but we were very interested in the theme of sacrifice. Hmm. Uh, and and so, I mean, it's so rousing. I, I I mean, I knew what would happen when I watched that episode again recently, episode ten. And I was still like my pace, right. my pulse was, mm -hmm. was racing and. Uh, and, and to think they finally have made it out to this place a, where we begin with three episodes, two episodes before this might be the last breath of fresh air that you ever breathe in. Mm -hmm. And here they are breathing that fresh air and there's, there's freedom in front of them. Mm -hmm. 
it, I don't, it, I don't, I remember it was in the room and I don't remember who said it first. Maybe it was me. Maybe it was Tony, but you're, you're putting yourself in the physical space of now I finally get to dive into the water and try to swim for my freedom. And I think we were trying to do just the math of like, okay, uh, how far away from the shore? Is it a mile? Is it two miles? Can these guys actually, you know, how many of them are going to make it? Are there going to be tie fighters coming in? Like, you know, how, what does it take you an hour to swim? Is that realistic? Like we're, we're dealing with just like the basic logic issues and then it was like what if kino can't swim <laughs> wow mm. what if, and then you're like oh of course, oh my god <laughs> he's just led five thousand people to freedom wow. and when and then you think of the line i'm gonna consider that i'm uh, that i'm already dead yeah because he knows mm -hmm. even if he makes it out there mm. that, that he's a goner mm. and then you're just like well uh that's that's when the story almost takes over and tells you what it needs to do. You're like, it's obvious that that must be done. Hmm. You know, it's not even a, up for debate. Hmm. Thank so you. It's it's really these, things, these things sort of arise slowly and surely and organically. I wish we were brilliant enough to know that <laughs> from the get go, but you kind of have to. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Alex from Star Wars Explained. Um, the prison arc, especially episode 10, is one of my new favorite Star Wars stories, and you just broke my heart again talking about it. Uh, it it's so well done. But the first two episodes, oh, the first two episodes are very bleak for a Star Wars story. The balance between despair and hope that has to be tricky to achieve. So, how did you achieve that balance? And were there any moments or situations that you considered for Narkina 5 that you ultimately decided, like, no, that's too far for a Star Wars story? Mm. Well, Asana can speak more in terms of, you know, if 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 anything down the, the road ended up being too far. Although, I, uh, from what I remember us discussing in the room and, and working on in the scripts, we pretty much did what we set out to do. Yes, yeah, but I, I, I mean, in terms of, look, in the previous three episodes you have the aldani raid uh, or i mean there's one episode that sort of buffers between those those but but if cassian's been on the aldani raid this was a one and done this is you know i want some money in my pocket i got to get out of here maybe i'm a little swayed by the you know the manifesto maybe um sort of seeing the you know the the way that the aldanis are being treated and then starting to you know i, I know i know you know, what, what happened on Ferrix and, and maybe this is starting to make me feel a little more anti-empire, you know, I mean, we know he's anti-empire, but I mean, in a more sort of, in a way with more agency. Um, but then he goes off to Niamos and he, he's doing what he set out to do, which is take the money and run and disappear. Uh, so if you really want to see the process of someone becoming a full-fledged rebel, they he needed to be confronted with the full oppressive weight of the empire uh and and it, it seemed like the very best place to do that is in a prison that kills hope you know um if if you're trying to eventually to get to a new hope you have to ask yourself the question uh um why is that hope new because that hope was being smothered so let's see it but then we know we're going to give the audience some friggin' hope by the end of it, at least. So it's worth the journey. And I hope we earn that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Caitlin from Sky Talkers. So nice to speak with you both today. Um, we've talked some about Cassian and the prison, and I wanted to shift gears and ask about Mon Mothma's story in these episodes. Um, we spent the majority of our time with her within her home and with her family. Can you talk about some of the writing choices that led to telling her story largely from within the home thus far? Well, with Mon Mothma, I mean, first of all, we, we, have, we knew we had the amazing actor Genevieve O'Reilly to to bring life to this character and she's so capable. And so uh, uh, we knew we could, we could, we could, uh, we could do almost anything we want there and she could pull it off. And if you're, you're asking yourself questions about people's journeys over the course of this series, um, she's becoming radicalized too. Uh, and, and, and with her cousin Vel representing the face of someone who's actually willing to get in the trenches 
uh, showing back up to her her home and reminding her that rev- that revolution uh, actually requires uh, violence and and sacrifice and danger. Seeing her begin to process that and think about sacrifice in a very real way as opposed to an abstract way is uh, is is crucial to her story. Uh, and and how and 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 it's sort of you know making you think about okay you need people that are willing to die for a revolution or a rebellion you also need people that are willing to raise the money <laughs> to buy those people the weapons and things they need in order to pull it off and so it's it's trying to paint the pic the fullness of the picture of, as as sort of you know disparate and kind of frayed and non organized as the rebellion is at this stage uh, how does it begin to coalesce. Um, and but then, what does it feel like to be in a senator's shoes who has the burden of that on her shoulders? And and you know, in ep- if episode ten really does focus on sacrifice, and you're hearing Luthen talk about how he sacrificed everything, you're seeing people like Kino and many other prisoners who are sacrificing their lives for the greater good, so that some of them can escape, if not all of them. You're you're looking at a potential sacrifice, or at least a sacrifice that's asked of Mon of of her daughter and we don't know what she's going to do yet stay tuned but we i hope have done you know the storytelling up until this point to get the sense that being married at 15th to 15 years old the parent maybe wasn't her favorite thing in the world and now she's being asked to consider sacrificing her daughter to the same tradition for the greater good you know but, so uh... But also, ahead, you know, Mosma, Mon Mosma has been a character that, you know, we have always seen the public persona and, you know, and we have seen, a, you know, a very particular Mon Mosma and, and really what Ander does, you know, really goes right behind the scenes and takes a character in a different, and shows us a very different aspect of her life. I, I mean, I would hope that people were gasping when you realize that she is actually fundraising money for the rebellion. And, you know, and, and, you know, and I think anything, you know, the humanity of her story and what brings her to become a rebel herself is, you know, automatically brings you also back to your families. You know, it is about, you know, her family connection and by her birth, you know, made her a senator at the tender age of 16 and dictated a lot of her life. And she has given it to it willingly. It's like, you know, she she took that burden on, you know, like a queen, you know, kind of ascending a, a throne. And, and, you know, it had a huge personal impact on her life. And the empire crouching down, now compromising also what she tried to believe to do through the Senate, you know, is... You know, is a human story to tell, and and the family connection, the impact of her marriage, her life as a mother, her old friendships, all those things are actually you know very much humanity, and show you how hard it is to make decisions when somebody pushes you too far that you can no longer you know be silent and do nothing. But the human sacrifice is huge, and I think therefore bringing us into her home feels very important um and, and 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 significant you know to tell what her sacrifice is and who she is and and why she acts you know in the way she does when we know the perfect persona that she has to play most of her life hello thank you for your time today i'm brian from pink milk where we talk star wars queerly and um First, I want to say thank you for creating Cinta and Vel for us. Uh, we know in the past that Disney's been reluctant to acknowledge queerness exists. Um, I also want to say thank you to Bo for writing that beautiful dinner scene where her queerness is actively challenged. Many of us queer folks have had to or continue to just sit at those um, <laughs> dinner conversations, especially with Thanksgiving looming here in the United States. <laughs> Um, I'm curious if there was any difficulties in creating those two characters, and if so, what sacrifices were had to make to get them on screen? Well, uh, luckily, uh, I'm really, <laughs> the, I, I, I mean, as far as I'm aware, there, there was no pushback whatsoever, as far as I'm aware, and and uh, you know, I, I, I think 
you know, first of all, let me say all credit goes to Tony sort of in the vision and conception of this show. And, and, um, and I think that, you know, when we were talking about Vel and Cinta early on, we weren't necessarily even talking about them being in a relationship. That was a discovery. You know, it wasn't like, oh, we want to uh, let's let's have this queer couple here at the center of our show. No, um, we, we were we had we had Vel, which we knew from the Bible was going to be a very important character. She's related to Mon and and um, and we really liked the tension between being the sort of rich girl from Chandrilla on the one hand and then eating the grubs, you know, and, and sleeping in a tent out on Aldani. <clears throat> but as we had to populate Aldani. We wanted these to be interesting people, you know, we're not just sort of like, uh, uh, you know, meat for the meat grinder that are going to get, you know, sort of torn up by this raid. Let's really consider each of them. And Cinta started to emerge. Yes. Then kind of organically. Yeah, um, they, they had to go out with each other. It just it just became yeah, like, part of the story. We really didn't set out, but. It just felt really right for 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 both of the characters and for the Aldani gang and for our show generally, for for Vel's choices in life and you know part of why she turned her back on her Shadrillian rich girlness. You know she clearly had you know had to you know fight you know for for being you know it's, it's all the problems that you know that we know that you know that it will be in the galaxy as true as as they are here on earth i think and it's just it just feels right to you know to broaden yeah. if we are going you know if we are the kitchen sink side and we're going really you know you know into all these characters and get to know them you inevitably want to know who they're like and how they live and what makes them taken you know not only for this one big moment but generally and i think it's a well that we meet you know who she is and who she loves and and you know and and is really a part of who she became and how she also became the rebel of the cause. So it was just a very natural thing. And we never got any pushback from anybody. And thank God it is 2022 and just about time that we can depict, you know, all of society um, rather than only very particular, acceptable, um, you know, traditional ways. I think, though, I think the key, you know, in, 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 and I hope why it works, you know, is that, uh, we started with people out in the world trying to foment rebellion. Um, and that's it. And then who are these people? And that we didn't start with this character is gay or this character is straight or this character is bi or this you know character is anything other than let's start with them. Let's drop in with them in action, trying to do something. Um, and then, and then if we arrived at that, it happened organically. So it, it it's not what defines the characters. It's just part of who the characters are, you know? And I, um, and, and I, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's how it happened. And, uh, and then, and then once you've made that choice, you just now have to be in the reality of these two characters to say, okay, what is this relationship? What what's right about it? What's wrong about it? What's work? What works? What doesn't? And then what are the dramatic implications down the line? You know, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brad from uh, Friends of the Force. Uh, speaking of Cinta and Bell, um, something Cinta says is, "I'm a mirror. You love me because I show you what you need to see," which I thought was an amazing line. Um, likewise, I think fans are loving Andor because it's showing us what we, the viewers need to see about this point in history. And I think dystopian stories are at their best when they say something about our own world. So uh, for you guys, for both of you, what sort of big ideas were important for you to examine through the show, whether it be this whole season or this, this sort of three episode arc, and what do you hope viewers see Andor's truth as? Well, uh, Sana, Sana has been much more front row seat from the very beginning all the way through. So I want to turn it over to her, but, but I'll, I will say that Tony walked into the room saying, I want to think about this first season is the education of Cassian Andor, right? Like how, what does it take to go from being a, a sort of self-serving um, <clears throat> guy who, who, who uh, you know, may have a distaste for the empire, but is ambivalent in terms of doing anything about it too. What does he need to go through an experience in order to have a real transformation where he is choosing by choice to, 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 to walk towards re rebellion. 
Um, and, and so I think how, how does that evolution take place in the human soul? And then you start asking yourself that of all the characters in your, in the show, um, what evolutions are they going through and, and how are they becoming the people they are? Um, and, and I, and I think a big part of this ultimately, I mean, cause we know where rogue one is going to get us, it comes down to sacrifice and you feel that very strongly in these three episodes. So, so I think personally me, and I can't speak on behalf of Tony, although we've talked about this sort of thing a lot. I, I think the cost of rebellion, the cost of doing something, <laughs> the cost of doing something that you think is right with big stakes. Um, what sacrifices are you willing to make? Uh, if these are questions that are swirling around, I think that's um, those are not only thought provoking, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, emotionally um, rich. Sana. No, I mean, I can only add to that, but it's also, you know, the the power that an average person can have when you are pushed in a, you know, to a place where you can't but fight back, you know, and it is a strength to actually move and shift something and, and you know, and be part of rebellion and try to change the world is something in all of us and in everybody. And I think that's why the series focuses on a lot of very normal people that are caught up in a very particular, you know, you know, time was in the galaxy far, far away, you know, where really, you know, which are the formative years of the rebellion. And, and you know, and I think what that does to you and how people react is just, you know, it's really at the heart of it and at the heart of Cassian Andor's journey, you know, that that who we know is the rebel that will give us life for the cause. And, and you know, so kind of at the heart of it, but I'm sure Tony Gilbert could it all put it all much better. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, this is Gabe uh, from Blast Points, and we're huge fans of George Lucas's first feature film, THX 1138. And there appear to be subtle and not so subtle influences in this prison arc to that film. When working on these episodes, was that something that you looked at thematically? So quite honestly, the answer is no, not not consciously at first. Uh, we, we started, as I mentioned before, from a place of how do we do a prison sequence that doesn't feel like every other prison we've seen um and and you know we, we start talking about this sort of bright white antiseptic space uh we started talking about ways that you could control the inmates without having to use the obvious like gun to the head or what have you um and awesome. so we just started from that very that very simple place but writers minds work in strange and mysterious ways so <laughs> So, I mean, eventually at a certain point, it, yes, it became obvious and it, that there were <laughs> some of what we were discussing, and especially as we got into production design, bared some resemblance to THX. Uh, and then once you sort of realize that, you can be intentional about it, of course. Um, unconsciously, maybe in, in one or all of us, uh, George Lucas's first feature film was bubbling forth and we weren't fully aware of it. I mean, you, as, as a writer, um, uh, you're constantly uh, uh, resurfacing things that have influenced you over your life, uh, whether it's, you know, experiences you've had or, or other pieces of art that you're not always fully conscious of when, when they're sort of resurfacing. Um, and then only later do you realize, oh yeah, wow. Like there is some, some and I actually, cause I, I had a, I assumed someone was going to ask about this. I, I went back and watched uh, THX again last night and I was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> holy, holy cow here. Yeah. There's, there's definitely, <laughs> But, um, you know, I, I take that as a good sign. You know, we're we're channeling a little bit of OG George Lucas, and that's never a bad thing. Sana? That's never a bad thing. <laughs> hi, Bo. Hi, Sana. Alden and Nikki here from Octo Radio. He's screens are weird. He's down here. Uh, in the hi. current climate, especially post-2016, we've seen resistance emerge across art, especially in TV. And we think Andor reflects that, particularly with moments like Luthen's monologue in episode 10. So as a writer and producer, respectively, how has crafting this particular story uh, personally helped you both unpack your own ideas and emotions concerning today's world? God, that's a deep question. How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've I mean, got all day. I don't know. <laughs> Foremost, uh, Andor is a work of fiction. 
right? And um, and we're working within a, a, a beloved and vast pre-existing franchise. Uh, and many people have in, interpreted that that franchise back to 1977 in a whole host of ways. Um, and and so you know, look, everyone's going to bring their sort of personal history and thoughts and you know uh, and, and 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 opinions about the world <laughs> to the table when when they're working on something. But but really, you know, our 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 goal is to service the characters that we've created and the story that feels right for them within a pre-existing framework and try to do something original with it. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, to whatever extent people want to, uh, you know, uh, interpret that you know, or see it through a particular lens and see it as applicable to anything, you know, uh, past or present, um, that, that's that's wonderful. We, you know, it, it means that maybe you've created something that generates interesting conversations or debates that pe- people could have in terms of influences for us. I mean, you could, you know, uh, you, know you, you could look at the French resistance, you could look at the American Revolution, you could look at a whole host of different things that one could draw comparisons to. And um, but uh, but but honestly, and you know, we're not sitting down trying to think about this in any sort of didactic or essayistic way when we're doing it we're literally like okay uh like so you know what's he like with his mom at breakfast you know like what does that look like and you just try to build a believable world and when you build a believable world naturally um you know and it's a complex and sophisticated world if you're lucky enough to get to that stage uh it it leaves a lot open to interpretation and that's a good thing sana therefore i think you can really also you know, in a fantasy and, you know, in a, when you're in, in that, when you're moving in that genre in a galaxy far, far away, if you're creating a, you know, a piece of fiction that is, you know, telling a truthful and complex and political story that is true to that world, I think, you know, it is a real, you know, a lot of people find, you know, emotional connections to characters, to situations, and it, that can, you know, touch them and, and and I think that is a really wonderful thing about fantasy. Thank you all so much for listening to our roundtable interview with writer Bill Wilman and executive producer Sonny Wallenberg. And a huge thank you to Lucasfilm for inviting us to this roundtable uh, and allowing us to participate. It was just such an amazing opportunity and um, we hope you all enjoyed our discussion and um, got some insight as to the creative thought process behind the series, because as we near the finish line, uh, it's all starting to to come together. And I can't believe we only have two episodes left. Um, but hats off to, to Bo Willman for writing three stellar episodes. Some Again, some of my favorite Star Wars TV, hands down. Truly just some of the best. I feel so grateful um, that we have this opportunity. And again, Thank you for listening to this episode and please go give uh, some love to the, our fellow interview roundtable outlets. Uh, Try Out of the Forest, That Gay Jedi, Tatooine Sun, Star Wars Explained, Sky Talkers, Pink Milk, Black Point, and Octo Radio uh, for asking great questions. And uh, we just want to thank everybody who took the time to listen to this interview as well as all of our patrons for help making this show happen every single week. We appreciate you all very, very much. With that being said, everybody, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Andor Candor. Thank you to Bo and Sana for their time. Thank you, Lucasfilm. And until next time, may the force be with you always.